Okay, welcome. Welcome, this is CPA Foundation Level, April 2022, Paper Question 3. Define Code of Ethics. Define a Code of Ethics. This is two marks. So, a Code of Ethics is a, a Code of Ethics is a set of guidelines. A set of guidelines is a set of guidelines or principles guidelines or principles that are meant to guide the employees employees behavior and conduct behavior and conduct at their place of work at their place of work so it's a set of guidelines set of guidelines or set of principles that uh, is supposed to guide employees behavior uh, and conduct at their place of work normally it's about the do's and the don'ts especially when uh, an employee is um, in a dilemma kind of a situation where he doesn't know uh, what to do because the situation presents a dilemma so the code of ethics will always present him with a solution on the right path that he's supposed to take so normally it uh, it uh, has uh, it's basically about the ethics and it upholds the ethical standards the expected standards of the the, the 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 organization or if it's a professional body of the that pro professional uh, the, 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 the 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 if it's a professional body the ethical uh, requirements or expectations of that profession so normally it's uh, written, it's written, and uh, it's supposed to be adhered to. It's supposed to be adhered to, and it's always written, and it has a, uh, uh, it directs, it directs on the best course of action, directs on best course of action and what is expected, best course of action and what is expected and acceptable what is expected and acceptable of an employee or of a pro professional. So it's basically a guideline, as we have said. These are very key terms, a set of guidelines, a set of principles meant to guide uh, the people in question. It could be employees, it could be professionals, and it's about the behavior, how they should carry themselves, how they should conduct themselves at the place of work. Normally, in a, in, a, in a dilemma kind of a situation where somebody doesn't know, everything looks uh, good or bad, you know, the code of ethics can come in and help uh, direct the right direction to take. And it's always expected that professionals or employees uh, uh, adhere to the set code of ethics. You, what you expect to get in a code of ethics are basically the values, the values that are uh, to be upheld by the organization. And we are talking about things like uh, honesty, transparency, honesty, transparency, integrity, such like uh, the fairness and justice. No, these are some of the things that you expect to get in a, the, the, the overall uh, information that uh, the code of ethics should be passing over to the uh, to the employees or whoever it is that the code of ethics is supposed to govern so this is two marks just capture any of these items uh, they are very important a set of guidelines principles to guide the employees or professions and it basically has it can direct on the do's and don'ts it is written and it's supposed to be adhered to it contains what is expected or uh, acceptable uh, code of conduct by the company or the organization in question. So that should be able to give you the two marks. Let's look at the next one. Discuss four ways through which code of ethics can be enforced in a workplace. Discuss four ways in which a code of ethics can be enforced in a workplace. Now, normally any code of ethics will uh, will uh, 
we've said that it channels you to a certain way of uh, behavior how you should carry yourself how you should conduct yourself and normally it's in line with what is acceptable in the what is acceptable in the company or what is acceptable as a general social uh, you know so the social uh, standards now any good code of conduct should be enforceable and there are so many ways of um, enforcing the code of conduct number one uh, if it's very clear that you have gone against the code of ethics then it's very important that we that uh, an invest an investigation is carried out investigation is carried out it's very important that an investigation is carried out and once it's found that you have gone against what has been stipulated in the code of ethics then you are uh, supposed to at least suffer the sanctions that come suffer the sanctions that have been imposed that have been imposed by the code by the code of ethics so there could be some sanctions which have been imposed in the code of ethics and those sanctions can apply to you once investigation has been carried out and it has been found out that you are in violation of or you have contravened the, 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 the what is contained in the code of ethics so uh, part of the the sanctions could be withdrawal withdrawal of uh, the membership withdrawal of membership if it's a professional body if it's a professional body withdraw of uh, membership or if it's not a professional body it's just a normal company they can report you report you to the report to the relevant to the relevant professional body to the relevant professional body and you know once you are reported the relevant professional body there are some uh, uh, actions that come with that like uh, payment of fines penalties you can be struck off from the list of members struck off from the list of members you can go through the disciplinary uh, measures put in place and sometimes even you can go through a whole litigation uh, process, you can go through the litigation process, and if you are found cul culpable, of course, you can pay damages, you can serve sentence, you know. All these, all these are possibilities when uh, the, the, the company reports to the relevant professional body, depending with the policies of that professional body. But... Uh, when you go against, uh, for example, the code of ethics of a company, you can be, uh, the, the, the company has the, the, the capacity to report you to the relevant professional body which can take any of this action. You can also be subjected to disciplinary, disciplinary uh, action by the company, you can be su subjected to disciplinary action which basically involves punishment. Uh, can and the, the disciplinary process can uh, yeah it will have punishment it can and it can end up in a termination it can end up in a suspension you know warnings all these are some of the things that uh, might come about with the disciplinary uh, action and so these come in as uh, measures that can be used to enforce the code of ethics that if you contravene or if you go against the set code of ethics then all this might be a possibility the other one is uh, uh we've talked of uh, withdrawal of membership or licenses i think we need to add something here and the other way of just enforcing this uh, the code of uh, ethics you know it, it it just doesn't have to go the the the, the just doesn't have to be the negative way can also be a positive way of uh, enforcing the code of ethics and we can enforce the code of ethics by being the role models being the role uh, models that is leading by example leading by example and this one also calls for rewarding whenever there's a chance a chance for rewarding uh, uh, good behavior ethical conducts or adherence to them uh, set uh, uh, standards then you can always reward and uh, it, uh, which is a good thing it's a way of enforcing the code of ethics because somebody will now feel that 
by doing something good or by living according to the set code of ethics, he is likely to be rewarded. And by doing that will be generally uh, enforcing uh, the code of conduct. We have also said that you need to be a role model so that you show by example. Then the other way also of um, enforcing uh, code of ethics in the workplace is to make sure that you communicate you communicate it clearly communi communicate it clearly so that every every uh, person in the organization is well aware of his or her ethical expectations his or her expect uh, or his or her ethical like what is expected of him ethically and this should be clearly visible to everybody so that in fact if you can put it in a place where every day they, they will be able to see and read and uh, you know internalize that will even be better it's a way of enforcing the code of ethics uh, in the workplace so that everywhere they go everything they do they see uh, they, they, they basically can see the guideline on how they are supposed to carry themselves in certain situations that present uh, in the course of uh, their doing the daily business and uh, we can also think of uh, providing the providing the protective mechanism protective mechanism especially to those people who are going to blow the whistle on uh, the 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 the, the uh, contravenors the people who have contravened the uh, or who have gone against the code of ethics there should be a policy that uh, should basically provide protection to them so that at the end of the day, people are, we have that whistle blowing which is active and everybody knows that by going against the set code of ethics, he can easily be uh, fished out of the rest and uh, disciplinary take action taken uh, on him. That will be, possibly will play a bigger role in deterring people from uh, involving themselves in activities that might be going against the code of ethics so i think we have mentioned quite a number and uh, and we've mentioned both positive and uh, negative ways of uh, of um, uh, of ensuring that we enforce the code of ethics these ones will end up uh, punishing uh, the, the the person who has gone against but we've also looked at the positive ways so just pick any that uh, you will be comfortable with and you can push them to the next level. Now, question 1B. Question, uh, sorry, question 3B. Outline four ways in which a surety may, might be discharged from a contract of guarantee. A surety might be discharged from a contract of guarantee. Now, a contract of guarantee. This is a contract that uh, where one party promises to uh, one party basically promises to stand in for the other in case he fails to meet his or her obligation the parties are normally the we have the creditor the one who issues a credit facility then we have the principal data principal data the one who benefits from the that facility and then we have the the surety the surety is the one who assures the creditor that uh, in case the principal debtor fails to pay, he will stand in for, for him. The one we normally call the guarantor, the one who stands in for the principal debtor, in case the principal debtor fails to pay. So he assures the creditor uh, that he will pay in case the principal debtor fails to do what? To pay. So the steward is the one who gives the guarantee. Now, the question is asking on four ways in which a surety might, might be discharged from a contract of guarantee. How can he be discharged, discharged from the contract of guarantee? Number one, the death of the surety. The death of the surety. So when he dies, that is the, he will be automatically he will be discharged from that contract especially if it's a continuing contract. So if it's a continuing contract, by the death of the surety, that simply means that the contract comes to a dead end. 
And then we also have notice of revocation by passing a notice of revocation as regards uh, future transactions, as regards future transaction future transaction but this one may not uh, may not discharge an already existing uh, contract of guarantee so if it was an open uh, uh, kind of a contract that the principal data can all can enter into a contract uh, or, and uh, the short will become his uh, uh, you know the guarantor then in such like a cases in such like cases the surety might put a notice of revocation as it regards future transaction and that way it simply means that he will not be liable for any future transactions of uh, between the principal data and the creditor so you can pass a notice of revocation as regards future transaction and that will discharge him from all contracts of guarantee that will be entered from that time he has passed the revocation going uh, forward then uh, variation in the terms and conditions of the contract variations in the terms and conditions variations in the terms and conditions of the contract variations in the terms and conditions of the contract against the variations in terms and conditions of the contract against the Okay, so the variations in terms, uh, in the terms and conditions of the contract, without the surety's consent, without the surety's consent, surety's consent. This is very important. Without his consent, if it's with his consent, then there's no problem. But without his consent, then this can lead to discharging, discharge of the contract uh, from being active. And then the other one is a. Uh, where we, when there's a when the creditor releases when the creditor releases the principal data when the creditor releases the principal data then the surety automatically uh, uh, becomes uh, discharged so when the creditor releases the principal data and there could be so many reasons why the creditor might choose to release the principal data one of them could be payment so if the principal data plays his part uh, exhaustively, then the, will, the, the, the creditor will release the principal data. So when the creditor releases the principal data, automatically the surety will be discharged from that contract of uh, guarantee. The other one is uh, an act, any act, any act, any act of omission, any act of omission. <coughs> by the creditor any act of omission by the creditor that will result in that will result any act of omission by the creditor that will result in uh, harming the rights of the surety harming result in harming or causing harm to the rights of the surety rights of the surety of the surety this can also lead to or using basically basically some of his rights to the principal data this will lead to the discharge of the contract of guarantee so these are uh, how many points five points the examiner is interested in only four so you can pick any any four from this we've said the death of the surety uh, discharges the contract of guarantee notice of revocation by the surety discharges the contract of guarantee variations in the terms and conditions of the contract without the consent of the surety that will also have the effect of discharging the surety then if the the, the creditor releases the, the the principal data for one reason or the other maybe has paid the entire amount automatically the surety is also discharged from that contract and then any act of omission or any act by the creditor that will put the surety in a in a situation that he really didn't expect or in a situation that will harm him or will uh, possibly prevent him from recovering whatever uh, it is that he possibly will have recovered from the principal data that will also have the effect of discharging the the the, the 
contract of guarantee. So these are five points. Pick any four and you'll be good to go. Now let's go to number C. Uh, item C, the, in relation to the law of property, explain the meaning of the following terms. Explain the meaning of the following terms. And the first term here is fee simple. Fee simple. Now, fee simple. This one simply means that uh, this is uh, in uh, the law of property uh, and it's about ownership. It's about ownership. So fee, simp fee simple is about ownership of land and it's uh it's basically the complete ownership complete ownership of uh land and uh this is where somebody has complete ownership possession of land and it can be used either uh for his own personal use it's free uh, actually it's also called freehold premises so he has been granted all the rights to use that piece of land as he or she may please. And it might uh, be used even for collaterals. It might be used for collaterals. He may pass a clean title uh, over that piece of land. And it might also be used for inheritance uh, purposes. So it is a absolute ownership of land, piece of land, which is also called freehold. The owner owns completely the piece of land without any limitations without any limitations without any limitations and also without any uh, conditions without any conditions occasionally and uh, what happens is that uh, you just need to meet the few requirements that uh, the government has put in place especially the taxes in form of rates so once you pay the land rates uh, then there's no problem, uh, you will not have any problem with the, the government of the day. Unless if the government, for some uh, good reason, feels that uh, it needs that piece of land for, you know, for the public benefit. But otherwise, uh, fee simple simply means that uh, the owner uh, reserves the, 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 the rights to use the land as he or she may please, and he can also pass it over to the next generation through inheritance. It's also called freehold ownership, and he is free to use that land as collateral to further his own uh, 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 interest. It is a, a land piece of land that is owned permanently, except if we have situations where the government might uh, possibly have uh, uh, require the piece of land to use it for the public benefit. And in such like cases, again, there has to be, you know, there has to be a contract. It's not just the, the, the government doesn't just come to interfere with the property like that. There has to be adequate comp compensation to that effect. Then we have the fee tail. Fee tail. Fee tail. This is land that is passed over to the next generation through inheritance. Through inheritance. So this land is not meant not meant to be to be sold, to be transferred, to be used as collateral. It is supposed it is purely for the generations to come and it's supposed to be maintained safely for the sake of future generations to come. So it's basically trusted and it's land that has been held for the benefit of the next generation or the upcoming generation. So it's restricted for sale uh, you cannot sell it it's basically for inheritance and it's supposed to be passed over to the next uh, generation mostly most of the states have uh, are not uh, issuing this type of uh, uh, deeds again to the owners because it has quite it has a, a number of so many disadvantages uh, that might not uh, be good for the, you know, for the nation. So those ones are uh, that that will be the definition. So we've defined uh, fee simple. We've also defined fee tail. Fee tail. We've said that is the trust established by deed or settlement, and it restricts the sale of inheritance or estate in real property. It basically prevents the land from being. Uh, sold, uh, but the, the land is supposed to be passed over to the next 
generation. We talk of fee tail. When you pass it over the next generation, fee simple, you can use it even as collateral and it can be, you can pass a good title on it. Okay. We move to next generation. So we move to the next I next uh, which is the last one, the last uh, bit of this question. Describe two ways in which absolute proprietorship is created. Absolute proprietorship. This is ownership of uh, ownership in totality. That's what we mean by absolute proprietorship. Just like uh, here in fee simple. Fee simple, we also talk of absolute ownership. Absolute ownership. Where you have all the claim and you can use this land as you wish. So here, uh, under the describe, under the, in this question, describe two ways in which absolute proprietorship is created. Totality in ownership. Number one can be through transfer, transfer, uh, where somebody transfers. Of course, you have to go through the entire process in the process of transferring. So you have to go through the entire registration process and you register it in your name. So transfer, which goes through the entire registration process, and then you also have inheritance, which should also have gone through the entire registration processes. These are the two major ones, transfer and inheritance. But we also have things like uh, conversion. Conversion can come in and uh, consolidation can also come in. But because the examiner is only interested in two, we can talk of transfer, where possibly you buy from uh, another person who has a clean title, and then you go ahead and register in your name, or you inherit from a person who has a clean title, and then you register it in your, in your name. So registration is key. Other than that, we have the conversions, and we also have consol consol consolidation. So those will uh, 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 basically, uh, any two of those, but specifically we can go with this, they will be used to, they can be used to uh, satisfy the examiner in this question. Two ways in which absolute proprietorship is created, inheritance, and inheritance is where property flows from uh, generation to generation in the same uh, bloodline. There must be some kind of a relationship. Once it uh, passes over to the next generation, of course, registration has to take place and it will lead to absolute ownership. Transfer, you buy from somebody and then, of course, you register it in your name. That will also lead to absolute proprietorship. Thank you. Let's meet in the next question. That is question four. Thank you.